Uh, good day, everyone. Thanks for joining. Uh, today, as Sabina says, we will be talking about graph algorithms, uh, and we're going to explain how they can be used. We'll give some examples, uh, specifically in the context of uh, banking and banking data. Uh, so we'll start, uh, for those of you who might be new to Neo4j, uh, with an introduction to graphs and, and Neo4j, the graph database and the graph company. Uh, we'll talk about the Neo4j graph data science library, which is what we're going to be using today in our examples. Uh, then we'll review the data that we're going to use uh, before we have the, the live demo later. Uh, and we'll talk about specifically the graph algorithms that we're going to use as part of that uh, demo on that data. And there'll be time at the end for uh, some Q&A. So first, introduction to graphs in Neo4j. Uh, so most people are familiar with relational databases. Uh, tables, columns, rows. Uh, this is the, the kind of classic way that we've been working with data and databases for decades now. Uh, Neo4j is a different type of database. We're going to be talking today about graph databases. Graph databases are all about the connections in your data, the relationships between your data entities. So rather than being oriented in rows and columns, uh, we're going to be talking about entities and the relationships between them. So you can see the difference on the left. Uh, the relational approach uh, on the right, the graph database approach. Uh, and this is really powering a new wave of innovation and competitive advantage for people who are using graphs, for companies that employ graphs. Uh, it's really a, a unique way of approaching data and one that's really centered, as I said, on connections between data. Um, sometimes this is connections between data that, that might be held in the same database that you have already or in the same data source, or it could even be relationships across different data sources that you have. Uh, and being able to make those connections and take advantage of them in the context that they give you, the insights they bring, uh, really is driving a new wave of competitive advantage uh, and, and innovation across uh, any number of industries. Uh, so Neo4j is the number one uh, database for connected data. Uh, we've, we've been around the longest. We have uh, the highest level of market penetration, the, the largest number of customers. Uh, and Neo4j really is an enterprise grade native graph database. So uh, what we're going to be seeing today, the Neo4j database in action, uh, is, is designed specifically for working with graphs. There's no translation layer between a, another type of database or data store underneath and the graph you're working with. Uh, Neo4j is graphs all the way down. Uh, and by enterprise, we mean it has all the features you would expect of an enterprise uh, database, any other type of database. Um, it's asset compliant, uh, it's scalable, it's performant, it's secure. Uh, it comes with a full set of tools for uh, operations and developer productivity. Um, you know, it can run in the cloud uh, as well as on premise. Uh, so all the things you would expect from any other database you have in your uh, enterprise, you can expect from database uh, from from the Neo4j database as well. So uh, for anyone new to graphs, uh, it, it's a, a different paradigm, as I said. It's not uh, oriented on uh, tables with rows and columns. Instead, it's really oriented around uh, three, uh, three components. And this is what we call the property graph model, uh, Neo4j's way of representing graphs. Uh, so the first element of a graph are nodes. Uh, and nodes are usually nouns, things, objects. Uh, you can see them here in our diagram. Uh, the circles are, are nodes. Uh, and nodes can be labeled. Uh, here we have two types of labels. We have a person node on the left, a person node on the right, and a car node on the bottom. Uh, and labels are just, just that. They're just a way of labeling uh, a node so that you can work with it, uh, know how to query it, know how it fits together. But it doesn't necessarily imply a schema in the same way that, uh, like in a relational database, every table uh, every row in a table has the same number of columns. Uh, we don't uh, necessarily have the same sort of restrictions on nodes just because they have the same label. Uh, then we have properties. So properties can be applied to nodes uh, as well as to relationships, which we'll come on to. Um, properties are key value pairs. They're kind of descriptors for your, your nouns, your nodes. Uh, so you can see the person on the left uh, has a name property of Dan. Uh, Dan was born May 29th, 1970, and we have his Twitter handle, at Dan. Uh, the person on the right also has a name property of Ann, and she was born December 5th, 1975. We don't have a Twitter handle for her. There's no Twitter property, uh, and that's okay. Like I said, uh, 
both being person nodes doesn't imply they have to have the same properties. Uh, if we get her Twitter handle later, we can very easily add it. Uh, if instead maybe we get her Instagram account or her email account, we can add that. It doesn't mean Dan has to have that as well. Uh, so it's very flexible. Uh, out of the box, it's schema-less or, or schema light. So that's nodes and properties. Uh, lastly, and the thing that makes graph databases graphs uh, are the relationships between these entities. Uh, so you can see uh, there are a number of arrows that link these nodes together. Uh, for example, uh, Dan drives the car, uh, which Anne owns. Uh, so relationships are usually verbs, and they, they link together your nodes and say how they're related to one another. Uh, every relationship in Neo4j is stored with a direction. Uh, so you can say Dan drives the car, right? It kind of fits together as a sentence. Uh, you wouldn't have a car that drives Dan. Um, sometimes the direction is important and sometimes it's less important. So uh, for example, uh, Dan lives with Anne, we can see here, uh, and that means logically Anne has to live with Dan. So we don't then necessarily have to have a relationship in the other direction. We can know that because Dan lives with Anne, uh, she must live with him as well. And we can choose to ignore that direction uh, when we query the database. Other times, uh, the direction is really important. So Dan loves Anne, it doesn't necessarily mean Anne loves Dan back. Uh, so here we can see that she does. We have the relationship in both directions, but we would need to know uh, that, that Dan loves Anne as well as Anne loves Dan. So then we have a relationship in, in, in both directions, two relationships. So those three uh, very simple elements uh, are, are what make up the, the power of the graph, really. Properties, relationships, nodes, these three things will tie together uh, as we start working with some of our algorithms and visualizations later on in our demo. So the Neo4j Graph Data Science Library. Uh, some of you may be familiar with uh, our graph algorithms package. It's, it's been out for a while. Uh, that was produced by uh, Neo4j Labs. The Graph Data Science Library uh, is the next iteration of that. And it's really uh, being productized, kind of moving forward, um, uh, brought closer into the database product, um, and, and uh, really kind of standardized, stabilized, uh, made even more performance and even more scalable. So what are graph algorithms? Uh, there's a lot of buzz around them, really. Uh, there's a lot of talk about them. People are very excited about them. I'm very excited about them. Uh, basically, graph algorithms are calculations uh, that uh, describe the topology, the shape, and the connectivity of our graphs. It's a way of, kind of working with the graph in an automated way to find, uh, to find patterns, maybe, uh, to do global traversals, to, to work through the paths in our graphs, uh, to get a sense of the structure, to find structure in, uh, in our graph. To, to make measurements, um, approximations, uh, get some heuristics, uh, find things that are important in the graph. Uh, but really what it boils down to is uh, it's, it's a way to get new insights or to extract new views of your data, new data uh, from what you already have in your graph. And so what do you do with them? Uh, we'll see some very concrete examples today, right? And I think this is always the big question. Uh, everyone knows that there's probably something exciting they can do with their data in, in a graph and with a graph algorithm, but what that is can sometimes be a little hard to visualize. Uh, so we'll be looking for patterns in our data. Uh, we'll be generating scores uh, against things in our graph, uh, enriching our graph. And today we'll be using that uh, to visualize our data, right, and to, to understand how we might use that to drive uh, some investigations into fraud or something like this. Uh, but you can also, if you, uh, you know, if you do data science or um, you have some analytics capability, uh, you can take the outputs of these graph algorithms and feed them into your machine learning as new features, right, which then you can use in your, your data science pipeline. So the graph algorithms in the uh, graph data science library really break down into five main categories, which we see here. Uh, the first is centrality or importance. Uh, and this is, oh, these are ways of generating scores or de you know, determining how central, how well-connected, how important uh, nodes are in your graph. 
Second is community detection, and this pretty much does what it says on the tin. Uh, it's a way of finding communities or clusters um, in your graph, right? And it's doing this not using some sort of um, demographic data, uh, like by looking at properties and how old is someone, or uh, you know, what do they do for a living, or so on and so forth. But it's looking at their con their connectivity in the graph, the shape of the graph around them. So how connected are uh, these nodes, uh, and and does that fit into a little community by the fact that they're all uh, so well connected to each other? Third is similarity. So this is uh, comparing nodes in your graph and saying how similar they are. Again, not by looking at some demographic information, but by looking at their shared connectivity in the graph and the shape of the graph around them. So uh, how alike are they in the neighbors that they have or in the relationships that they have? Fourth, uh, pathfinding and search. These are ways of evaluating paths in the graph. Uh, Neo4j already has a, a uh, a, a shortest path, an all shortest path function built right in that looks at the shortest path between nodes based on the number of relationships or how many hops in the graph that path is. Uh, the pathfinding algorithms, uh, many of them take a different approach and instead look at the shortest path using some kind of weight on those relationships. Uh, so for example, you could use distance or cost or uh, time or something like this as a weight on your relationships. And then the shortest path will become the one that has the shortest overall time as a weight on those relationships. And lastly, there's link prediction. Uh, so this is sort of similar uh, to the similarity algorithms. Um, again, they uh, compare the shape of the graph around two nodes and use that to predict uh, or to estimate the likelihood that those nodes will be connected in future, right? Or that there is some sort of uh, more implicit link uh, relationship between those nodes that isn't explicit in the graph already. And if you want the full list, uh, here's the, the the full detailed list of all the algorithms that are implemented in the Graph Data Science Library. And you can see on the bottom there, uh, there's a link to the library documentation, uh, which has all the instructions for installation and, and how to use all the algorithms. Uh, and that link will be included with the materials we share afterwards. And you can see there's uh, four graph algorithms that are highlighted here. These are specifically the ones that we're going to be working with today in our, our, our demonstration. So lastly, uh, we'll take a look at the data that we're going to be using uh, in our demo. Um, when we talk about banking uh, and looking at you know graphs for banking or data for banking, uh, a bank can have a lot of different types of information, right? Uh, you can have internal information, organizational information. Uh, you can have information about your customers, about your products and your services. Uh, event data like payments or, or money transfers, or even third-party data, uh, social media or credit rating agency data and this kind of stuff. Uh, but today we're really gonna be focusing just on two of these areas. We're really gonna be looking at customer data uh, and, and specifically bits of identification you might have about a customer uh, as a bank and event data, so movement of money, transactions between accounts. So our graph is, uh, is pretty simple, the shape of it. Uh, it's, it's really made up by just a few key components. Um, so we can see uh, clients in blue. Uh, so these are customers uh, of our bank. Uh, the sort of red and pink shapes uh, nodes down to the lower left uh, are the forms of identification that we can have about them. So we could have an email address for a client, a phone number, or uh, this is an American data set, so a social security number. Uh, social security number is a unique identifier uh, for, for people in the US. Um, and it's important to know that uh, a client could have multiples of these. So we might have more than one phone number, more than one email address, uh, uh, but social security numbers are meant to be unique. Um, in transactions over here on the right in green, uh, these are uh, movements of money. So we have a node to represent the transaction itself. Uh, that would have things like what time it was uh, executed at, what the amount was, and so on. Uh, and then the relationship between clients is you have one client who performs the transaction, so that's the sender of the money, and you have one client who's at the end of a two relationship from the transaction, so that means that's the person receiving that money. Uh, and then over on the far right, 
Uh, we're not really going to work too much with this today, but just to give a sense of how else we might be able to extend this data, uh, we could have not just clients, like regular retail banking customers, but also merchants, so we can understand who's buying what from whom, uh, or maybe even some information about other banks. So you might be sending money outside of this bank to another bank, and you would you would know what banks we're, we're transacting with. Uh, there's also some uh, relationships here in yellow. Uh, so we're not, again, we're not really going to focus on those today, but just to help you understand what a more realistic data set might look like, uh, we have basically a linked list of transactions for uh, a client. So we have from a client, we have a relationship that says it's the first transaction for that client. And then that transaction links to the next transaction in time. That one links to the next transaction in time. Uh, so we can understand the order in which transactions happen for a particular client. And then the end of that linked list, uh, we have uh, the last transaction. So we can very easily find the last transaction that a, a customer made and then understand that whole sequence in time. So that's our model. Uh, we've done a couple things to the data uh, to, to get it ready to run some algorithms and to, to find some interesting patterns. Um, so there have been, uh, this is a, uh, randomly generated data set, uh, so it should should look realistic, um, but it's completely fake. It's not taken from any real bank. Uh, and a few of the transactions in the database have already been flagged as fraud. Uh, so this could be maybe someone rang up and said their credit card was stolen and they didn't make that payment, uh, or uh, maybe some other um, uh, analytics or manual process has uh, led someone in the bank to flag a particular uh, transaction as fraud. So we know there's a couple fraudulent transactions in the database. Uh, so we can see uh, there's three ways that an account, a client, could be flagged uh, in our database. One is they could be associated with that fraud. So if there's a client node who performed a fraud flagged uh, transaction, that customer is flagged in our database. Um, another way that you could be flagged would be if you have uh, a social security number in common with another client node. So as I said before, social security numbers are meant to be unique, um, but if someone has stolen someone else's identity or is using a synthetic identity, they might be using a social security number that someone else is already using. So if two accounts have the same social security number, big red flag, and both of those client accounts are labeled as flagged. And then finally, uh, if you have a client who has more than one social security number, that would be a flag as well. You should, you should only have one social security number. Um, and so if you're pulling data in from multiple sources, you have multiple different records for a customer, and you find that they have more than one social security number in your graph, that would be another reason to flag. Uh, so here we're using the word flagged. Uh, you know, we're not necessarily implying that we know uh, something is fraudulent. So these people could be victims of, of fraud as well. Right? So we're not necessarily implying that uh, any of these people have done something fraudulent themselves, but it is a reason to flag this account for review because something fishy is going on. So now we'll cover the four graph algorithms that we're gonna see in action shortly uh, using that same data model. Uh, so the first algorithm we're going to look at is PageRank, and this is a very famous, very popular algorithm um, used by Google, invented by Google, uh, to help order search results. Uh, and what this is going to do for us is help us find important nodes uh, by looking at their relationships. It's really uh, kind of measuring the flows of money through the graph and, and to what nodes those flows head towards, right? So you can see here, um, node B is a big node. Um, it's got direct relationships with a bunch of other intermediate nodes that are a little bit smaller. Those have another set of uh, nodes beyond them that are even smaller. So kind of this measures how influence moves through the graph, right? If money is, is kind of being transferred to one person and that person then transfers money to another person, uh, the, the third person in that chain has kind of got a higher page rank score, money moves in their direction. Uh, and this can be used for things like fraud detection and anti-money laundering. Uh, so for example, if we were to look at a graph 
uh, of my bank and we looked at my node in, in the bank, we wouldn't expect my node to have a very high page rank score, right? And if it did, that would be suspicious, right? Why, why, does, why is Joe sitting at the end of all these kind of chains of money? Uh, and it can also be used, we'll use it really to kind of prioritize analysis. We'll say, you know, what are the most important nodes in this graph, in this visualization? Where should I be focusing my attention? Um, this is one measure of, of importance in our graph. And we do that um, by really looking at the, the performed and the two relationships. So we look at transactions between accounts. Uh, so we've already run the PageRank algorithm uh, for the sake of time, uh, and we took the results of that and stored them in a PageRank property, as you can see here, on our client nodes. So we'll be able to use that PageRank score uh, in our visualization uh, and, and any kind of investigation we perform. Second, weekly connected components. So what we'll use weekly connected components for is to find uh, kind of disconnected subgraphs in our data, islands of data. Uh, and, and in our case, we're going to be doing that, uh, looking for communities based on shared bits of identity. So who has, who shares phone numbers, who shares email addresses, or even who shares social security numbers. Right? Um, so in, in real life, you could use this for something like householding. So it's a, it's a common problem for a lot of businesses trying to figure out, um, you know, your customers might not explicitly tell you who they're related to, who they share a house with, uh, who's in their family, uh, but you might be able to determine this by using a very similar approach, right? understanding who shares bits of identity and can you build a little community um, based on that. Uh, also, we'll be looking at it uh, from the viewpoint of, of maybe stolen or synthetic identities, right? Uh, so that looks like this. Um, we use the weekly component, the weekly connected components algorithm, um, using the email, phone, and social security number um, uh, nodes and the relationships to clients to determine these communities. Right, and again, we've run this algorithm already and generated a component ID, and this is what we can use to look at communities. All the clients who have the same component ID are in the same community based on their shared relationships to emails, phone numbers, and social security numbers. Then we'll look at node similarity. Uh, so again, we're going to be doing node similarity based on relationships to phone numbers, social security numbers, and uh, email accounts. Uh, and we'll say which nodes are the most similar because they have these same neighbors, right? Um, and instead of writing a, a property back to the database like we have with our page rank score in our communities, instead with node similarity, we create a relationship between two nodes to say that they are similar. So in real life, uh, we could use this for entity resolution. Uh, it's really good for data quality uh, cleanup, looking for aliases, things like this. So if you have two nodes in your graph who share the same pattern of behavior, are connected to so many of the same things, 95% similarity, something like this, you might say, actually, I think these are the same people. Maybe there was a type somewhere, maybe someone has given me an alias. Uh, maybe we can condense these things together into one uh, one entity in our graph. So very good for entity resolution um, and data quality. Uh, again, will can also help us identify synthetic identities or stolen identities, where uh, identities in our graph are so similar by, by the fact that they're sharing these bits of ID. So again, we'll be using uh, the relationships between clients and emails, phone numbers, and social security numbers uh, to do this comparison. We write a similar uh, relationship between nodes to indicate that there's a similarity between them. Uh, and on that relationship, there will be a score property. It says how similar they are. Uh, zero uh, would be no similarity. And, and we kind of cut everything off. We, we only run the similarity algorithm here in our demo. On on clients that share two pieces of the same identity, right? Uh, so we wouldn't have a zero or like dot one or something like this, but uh, zero using this algorithm is no similarity at all. And one is an exact match. Uh, so somewhere between zero and one is where our scores will end up. Uh, and then lastly, we'll be looking at the Louvain modularity algorithm. So again, this is a way of finding communities in our graph based on uh, the relationships between them. The neat thing about Louvain, uh, we, won't, we won't get into it so much today, but Louvain can generate, it's kind of iterative, so it'll generate a number of 
sets of communities that a node might belong to until it kind of reaches the end, um, which is kind of stasis. Um, and you can track those uh, intermediate communities throughout. So you can get a different view of communities within communities within communities until you kind of arrive at the final, uh, the final result. Uh, so we'll be looking at uh, this community instead of shared bits of identity like we did with weekly connected components. Today we're going to be looking uh, with Louvain at um, transaction behavior. So communities that transact with each other can be found communities based on uh, transactions between them. So this could again be used in real life for things like fraud ring detection or anti-money laundering where you have a lot of accounts that are transacting with each other uh, more so than, than uh, other accounts. Okay, and again, uh, that looks very similar um, to PageRank, where we're using uh, the transaction behavior around nodes to generate the output of our uh, algorithm. We're storing uh, the, the final Louvain community uh, as a property on the client again, uh, and we'll use that in our visualization and our searches to find uh, groups of, of people based on their transaction behavior. Okay, so. That was our intro and our overview. Uh, so now we'll actually get into looking at our graph. Uh, first, just to give you a, a sense for what our graph looks like. So what we're seeing now is the Neo4j browser. This is a, a free tool that ships with every instance of Neo4j, uh, but it's really quite developer focused. Uh, so um, to do the data-driven styling, we can see here in the Bloom interface, um, there's an option for uh, changing the color or the size based on our page rank property. So uh, what we want to do is make uh, nodes with a higher page rank score bigger uh, and lower page rank scores can be smaller, right? And this will help us uh, very quickly identify. We can see now um, there are some nodes which are much bigger, right? Uh, and will get our attention. Will give us a place to start. So, uh, you know, we might be more interested in looking at some of the uh, the nodes with high page rank scores. Uh, okay. Uh, so we can do the same thing. Um, we know that there's uh, a flag. We know there's a label that can be applied to nodes that are uh, that are flagged, right? Uh, and we might be interested in uh, being able to see those nodes uh, as well, uh, so that it's clear to us which ones uh, might be associated with fraudulent behavior, right? So here we'll apply uh, a red color to any node that has the label flagged. So we can see here uh, in what we've pulled back, there's two uh, two nodes here uh, that have been already flagged in our database. There's Sophie and there's Connor. Connor has a higher page rank score. We can see that straight away. Uh, but if we wanted to, we could start to understand, you know, maybe what uh, what transactions they've performed, and start to get a sense for uh, what the graph might look like around them. Let's take a look at all the flagged accounts in the database and start getting a sense for uh, how much potential fraudulent behavior or how many victims of fraud uh, there might already be, what those look like in our database. Uh, so we can see very similar visualization, uh, but here every node that we're looking at has already been flagged. Right? Again, if we want to uh, drill in and start to understand maybe why they might be flagged, uh, so here, uh, this node has uh, two social security numbers, uh, which would be uh, an automatic reason for them being flagged, as we discussed before. Uh, you should really only have one social security number in the database. Uh, let's pick another one and see. Uh, this one only has one social security number. Uh, see if that social security number has, there's two people who share that social security number. Uh, so both Charles and Angel have that uh, social security number. And so that would be a reason for both of them to be flagged, right? So uh, you can you can really uh, explore the data manually, right? If you're doing a specific investigation, want to, to start uh, under, understanding specific details or from a, a particular starting point. Um, 
that's uh, perfectly fine in Bloom, right? You can do this sort of searching and this sort of uh, investigation manually. Um, but often what we want is to be able to execute a particular type of query, right? So uh, as, a, as a business user, maybe as an analyst, you uh, always want to be able to execute something. You want to look at the, uh, you know, find me the, uh, the node with the highest page rank and, and understand um, the network around them, something like this, right? So uh, as someone who knows Cypher, what I can do is write a, a pre-written uh, pre Cypher query, a, a templatized query uh, that I can then um, put behind a very simple search phrase so that people can use it, right? So uh, here, for example, uh, we have a, a number of them that I've already written. Um, If we look at, uh, so maybe we want, so maybe we want to do this. Uh, show the uh, uh, no, nope, I want the transaction network of uh, within the largest community. Yeah, um, you can um, execute very simple uh, search phrases and use that to bring back very complex results. Right. Uh, so the cipher behind this, um, you can hide from your end users. Right? Uh, yeah. Each one of these calls a, a cipher query, uh, and, and then that cipher query um, can be arbitrarily complex, right? Um, so there's a, uh, we'll see some examples of this in, in play today where we're uh, executing kind of more complex queries that are already pre-written uh, so that uh, your users don't have to know how to do this, right? Uh, so for example, if we wanted to see the, the client with the highest page rank uh, and explore the transactions around them, this goes to the database, finds uh, the node that has the highest page rank score, uh, and then pulls back um, the, the network of transactions that are around them. So this will help us understand why this person has the highest page rank score. All right. So uh, this is Jordan Conway. Uh, you can see he sits kind of in the middle of uh, a large number of transactions. Uh, and it kind of makes sense. Uh, you can see visually uh, all these yellow uh, nodes are different clients. The blue nodes between them are transactions. You can kind of see a lot of clients transacting with, uh, you know, maybe a node like this one uh, that then uh, transacts with more central nodes. Uh, and Jordan sits between these networks of connections, right? So uh, uh, money kind of generally moves towards uh, the outside of this, uh, uh, the, the little clusters on the outside, the leaves maybe, uh, in towards him, right? Which is why he has such a high page rank score. He sits in the middle of this uh, kind of network of transactions. Uh, and this is only looking a few levels out. It can be very difficult to visualize uh, the, our whole graph with all the millions of nodes. But that's what PageRank does. It considers the whole graph. Uh, it looks many levels deep, <coughs> excuse me, in order to um, in order to generate these scores. So that's a little bit about PageRank and uh, how we can use PageRank for searches and um, to drive our visualization. Uh, now we'll take a look at the weekly connected components uh, communities that we generated. Um, so I can show you actually um, in the browser what it looks like to run one of these algorithms, right? So. Uh, weekly connected components, uh, even though I've already saved it to the database, uh, there's another option that I can use in this algorithm to stream the results back uh, to the browser or to the consuming client. So that's what we're doing here. Uh, we're using uh, weekly connected components, um, basically to pull back every client uh, and then looking for um, clients that have the same intermediate piece of ID. So either they share a phone number and email address or uh, uh, social security number, uh, and that's how we drive the creation of our community who shares these bits of identity, right? So uh, this is what it looks like to call one of the graph algorithms. Uh, we can run that, uh, and in a second or two, we should get the results. So here's a number of component IDs, community IDs it's generated. And uh, it also tells you how many members there are in that uh, in, in that community. So community 106 has 18 members. 
um, community 4932 has 14 members. Uh, and this is really just an arbitrary kind of identifier for the community. Um, but there's no, no other meaning behind that component ID. So we've saved those results uh, to uh, our database and the component uh, ID. So we'll, we'll say 23. We'll take a look at uh, community number 23. Uh, so these are all the client nodes that are labeled with uh, component ID 23. Uh, there's three of them, Sh Charlotte, Owen, and um, uh, Neve. They all have the same last name, Harrington. Uh, if we expand in the, the uh, in the Bloom interface, we want to specify we're looking for particular relationships in these. We want to see what email, phone, and social security number they have, right? Which is how we'll know how uh, how they form this community. Uh, so we can see they each have a phone number uh, and they each have a social security number. Uh, all three of them, their accounts have the same email address. And if we highlight these things, uh, if we um, select the social security numbers, the phone numbers, and the emails, uh, and try to expand beyond them to see who else they might be connected to, we can see that they're not connected to anyone else. And so that's what makes this the community, right? Uh, you could draw a ring around these uh, nodes in the graph, and no one else is connected to those uh, emails, phone numbers, or social security numbers. It's only these community members uh, who share these bits of identity, and so that's how we've identified them as a community. Uh, if we take a look at the one that we just saw from our live results, uh, the streamed results, component ID 106, we can see this is a bigger community, uh, and there's already a few people in there that are uh, flagged, uh, as well as some, some pretty sizable um, page rank scores, right? Bigger nodes uh, than we saw before. So if we take a look at the way uh, these folk are connected, uh, what we can see is uh, a couple sort of uh, little uh, little clusters, really. Uh, so if we take a look at um, this group up here at the top, uh, they all use the same email address. And this looks like the Knowles family. Uh, there's uh, maybe another family on the right, the Roach family, uh, the Tran family uh, down below. Uh, and then really here in the center of all of them, the bridge between a lot of these communities, uh, it looks like it's Kayla Knowles, right? And this email address here. Uh, so again, uh, if we were to look at these uh, emails, phone numbers, social security numbers, uh, no one else would be sharing them. Uh, this is the community built around these shared bits of identity uh, with, the, with that kind of bridge node in between them. Right. So the, the graph and the graph algorithm are able to do this at scale, right? Uh, to to uh, generate these sorts of community scores, look at the entire graph and these relationships uh, at, at scale. And, and as you've seen, you know, quite, uh, quite good time. So a very interesting way to start finding, uh, you know, if maybe you're looking at KYC scenarios, uh, groups of, of people that might be sharing uh, pieces of identity, maybe those are stolen identities or synthetic identities is quite common. Uh, so this would be a good way to identify those patterns at scale. Okay, so uh, that's uh, our look at weekly connected components. Uh, we'll take a look at similarity, uh, and, and this will this will be quite similar to what we've seen, I guess, because our similarity uh, algorithm was run on the same thing, the, the shared bits of identity, right? So rather than looking at large communities who share uh, little bits of identity, here we're looking for uh, client nodes that themselves uh, are alike in the fact that they share at least two bits uh, of identity. So we could start just by looking for uh, client nodes that are similar uh, to other client nodes. So we type that pattern in, into Bloom, uh, and it will return every client node who has a similar relationship to every other client node. And we can see, uh, maybe not unsurprisingly, uh, there's a lot of flagged, um, a lot of flagged clients that uh, share bits of identity with each other. Uh, uh, but again, it can be, uh, we, we have PageRank here, we can see uh, which nodes are, are relatively more important by that measure in our graph, but what we can't see is how similar uh, 
uh, these nodes are, right? We could uh, drill into them uh, and see uh, this one has a score of 0.33, uh, this one has a score of 0.33, that one has a score of 0.5. Um, it, it would better, I think, uh, easier to visualize if we apply the same sort of rule-based styling to our uh, to our relationships for similar. Right, so we can do that um, by applying a size rule. Uh, a higher score generates uh, a thicker relationship, uh, which we can see here. A lower score uh, is a thinner relationship. So again, we can start to uh, visually understand uh, in our graph how uh, different entities might be similar to each other. Uh, but maybe uh, we're more interested in trying to see if there's any clients that are unflagged that are very similar to clients who are flagged, right? So uh, if you're not flagged, but you're very similar to a flagged account, maybe you should also be flagged, right? So uh, we have uh, a query written for this uh, and we can see there are two uh, unflagged accounts that are similar to ones that are flagged. So uh, Annabelle uh, is, is a uh, has 0.5 similarity to uh, Alia. Uh, if we uh, do the same thing and try to understand why they're so similar, uh, we can see the emails, social security numbers, and phone numbers that they share. Uh, so they share two pieces of identity, and then uh, they each have one piece of identity that is unshared. So uh, they each have their own social security number, but they share a phone number uh, and an email address. Uh, and we can see uh, the bits of information that they share as well. Uh, so uh, Uh, they each share two pieces of information, uh, and then they each have their own pieces of information as well. Uh, so this is another way, uh, you know, if you identify um, specific patterns or specific uh, entities in your graph that you want to find out who or what is similar to them, uh, these are the sorts of techniques you could use uh, to, to then understand who is most similar, uh, who then might also be, uh, we'll say, uh, likely to commit fraud or likely to be a victim of fraud or, uh, or whatever it is that you're trying to compare. And then lastly, uh, we'll take a look at uh, Louvain. Uh, and we'll start by uh, maybe looking at the five largest Louvain communities. Uh, so these are the communities uh, generated by the Louvain algorithm that have the most number of members, right? So uh, in here are five different groups. We can see there's a, a couple flagged accounts in there as well. Uh, here, I think instead of uh, wanting to see the difference between flagged and unflagged, we want to be able to visually identify um, uh, the different communities that we're working with, right? So instead, we're going to remove the uh, flagged rule and uh, we'll apply something for Louvain community. Uh, so now we can see we've colored the Louvain communities differently. Uh, we can see uh, which uh, which nodes are members of which communities, and then we can start to think, well, uh, this, you know, this is a pretty big uh, page rank score, this purple node here. Uh, here's another one. You know, maybe we want to drill into uh, some of the details or, or take a look at these particular communities, right? Uh, so we can do this. Uh, this is, uh, there's 159 nodes pulled out now. Uh, we can take a look. Uh, adjust the purple ones by dismissing uh, all the other ones. Right, so now we can uh, look at the details of this community, right? So uh, it's a community 19823. Uh, and we have another uh, saved query. Uh, so show transactions among Louvain community. Uh, and I've gone and forgotten. 19823. 
And so here we can see uh, transactions that have happened between members of this community. Uh, and from there, we can start. Uh, uh, maybe we can turn off uh, the Louvain styling uh, and turn back on our flag styling so we can start to understand uh, whether there's anything dodgy happening uh, within this community. We can combine some of these things together. Uh, so we could, uh, we, we have another um, pre-written query. Uh, we want to show um, the community with the most influential uh, flagged account. So here we're taking an account that's flagged, the one that's flagged with the highest page rank score that's most influential. And then we're taking a look at the community uh, that sits around that. Uh, so again, this is taking advantage of Louvain. Uh, we can see it's uh, Aubrey here, who is uh, the, the flagged account with the highest page rank score. We can see the community and their transactions that sit around that. Uh, so we can see uh, money moves from down here, Nathaniel, Adrian, and Brody uh, towards uh, Aubrey, uh, as well as from Jack here. Uh, and then we can see uh, Aubrey has also uh, transacted with Gabriella. Right? So uh, this is the community based on transactions uh, that sits around the uh, flagged account with the highest page rank score. Right? So uh, this might lead us then to take a look at Gabriella, or maybe we want to take a look downstream and say, well, if uh, Aubrey has been flagged uh, and, and is potentially fraudulent, uh, maybe Colton or Henry or Blake uh, should also be investigated to understand whether uh, they should be flagged or whether uh, uh, they might be involved in some kind of fraud. Uh, we can also see the community with the most flagged accounts, or a, a community with the most flagged accounts. So what we did was looked at all the Louvain communities and counted how many uh, flagged accounts uh, they had in them. Uh, and now we're looking at, at one. Uh, so three is the maximum amount of flagged accounts in any of our Louvain communities. This is what one of them looks like. Uh, so again, we can see uh, Scarlet here. Uh, has quite a high page rank score. Uh, we can see money moving uh, towards uh, this account through this network. And again, we can see uh, there's a number of flagged accounts that might make us uh, um, further our investigation, right? Maybe Scarlet here should be uh, uh, flagged or under investigation because there's three flagged accounts uh, uh, sending money towards her account. And then we might also look um, downstream. So, you know, are any of these accounts that send money through any uh, of these other fraudulent accounts or flagged accounts like Parker? Uh, do we want to look downstream through that community to see what else is going on? Okay, um, so hopefully that's given you uh, a nice taste of how some of these graph algorithms can be applied uh, to some you know basic transaction data uh, is very simple data model you know as long as you know who sends money to who these are the sorts of tools that you can use on top of that data uh, as long as you know bits of identity about your customers or how they might be related to uh, pieces of id or addresses or phone numbers this sort of thing then these are the sorts of analysis that we can apply um, and the ways that we might um, the ways that we might visualize that output uh, and so with that, I'll hand over to Sabina for the rest of the time we have uh, for Q&A. Thank you, Joe. Um, one question we received several times um, is if you can, um, if you can share um, the demo data and the cipher queries. So I have good news for the people that asked that question. Yes. <laughs> uh, so uh, the graph data science library uh, is kind of uh, just launching. Um, and there's a connections event, uh, the graph data science Neo4j event, uh, which is happening uh, April 28th. There's a series of virtual conferences. Uh, I'm doing uh, a similar presentation to this with a few different graph algorithms and a few different uh, approaches. Uh, but on the same basic data as part of that conference. And um, at that same time, we'll be launching a Neo4j sandbox that has this data and these queries on it. 
Um, so in the next two weeks, you can look forward to that. Uh, you can just Google Neo4j sandboxes, or, or we can send a link to the sandboxes uh, after this. There's a number of sandboxes that exist already for, for all sorts of different use cases, but uh, what you saw today will be turned into a, a sandbox pretty shortly. Thanks. Um, another question is, which algorithms could be implemented in real-time process to catch fraudulent transactions? Sure. Uh, good question. So um, just by their very nature, right, uh, just because of, of the way they work mathematically, some graph algorithms are not very well suited to real-time scenarios. These are algorithms that have to look at the whole graph, that have to do things iteratively. So things like between the centrality that have to compare the shortest path between every node and every other node in the network and count who sits on that path. They're very computationally intensive and they can take a lot of time. So uh, things like that are better suited to run uh, more in a, in a batch mode, right? Um, but other graph algorithms are, are better suited to being able to run in real time, right? So um, especially things like the, um, pathfinding algorithms where you, you know we have a start node and an end node and you want to find the shortest path between them uh, by by using a weight these sorts of things are, are good for running uh, uh, some of, some of the other algorithms uh, you can run in real time I mean it, it depends on the size of your data I suppose as well um, you, you saw I was able to run weekly connected components um, very quickly on my laptop on this sort of data set so it, it depends on how much computing power you have but some algorithms are just like not well suited uh, to, to doing in real time, but there, there are many that are. And if you're looking at an isolated portion of the graph, so it, maybe if you're trying to do fraud detection or prevention, you want to look at the data around the data you're inserting into your graph. So maybe you're inserting a new transaction, you want to look at the transactions around it or uh, the, the people near it. If you're looking at kind of an isolated part of the graph, then you could use some of these tools as well uh, in real time. Looking at the time, I'm going to um, uh, take one last question. Um, this is, is it possible to implement your own algorithms within the Neo4j environment? Another excellent question. Uh, so yes, it is. Uh, I mean, you always, you always could. Um, Neo4j allows you to write uh, custom procedures. Uh, so anyone who's who's used any of the graph algorithms before or has used APOC, you know it's a, a jar file that you write that uses Neo4j APIs and, and kind of sits as a plugin uh, in the database. Um, so you could do that. Um, but the graph data science library also comes with some tooling to allow you to implement new algorithms or, or kind of bespoke versions of algorithms uh, in a much easier way. Uh, so yes, it, it is absolutely possible to extend what's here, to customize what's here, or indeed uh, to, to implement you know, your, your own algorithms uh, pretty easily on top of Neo4j. Thanks again, Joe. Thank you for presenting. Uh, and thank you to our audience for joining us today. Um, so bye-bye from our side and have a great day. Thank you.